The SUV market offers a vast choice these days, but there are very few family-sized contenders that are actually properly capable off-road. Mitsubishi Shogun Sport, though, is one of them. Few compromises are made for tarmac territory, but this car can still be a luxurious seven-seater highway tourer that's as confident on the A6 as it would be in the Alps. If you yearn for the days when an SUV really could cross the Serengeti, then you'll probably like this one very much indeed. The Mitsubishi Shogun Sport offers buyers looking for a larger mid-sized seven-seat SUV a tougher option that has real off-road credibility. The fundamentals here are based upon the brand's L200 pickup, but Mitsubishi has re-engineered them with extra technology and a bit of stylish crossover sheen. That can't, though, disguise the reality that this is, in the brand's own words, the most capable SUV it's ever made. Certainly for those wanting a car of this kind that can really walk the walk as well as talk the talk, you'd think that this one might have some appeal. Now, we've seen the Shogun Sport in the UK before, but not for some time. The first generation PA series version of this model was also L200 based and launched back in 1998, initially badged as the Shogun Challenger, before being renamed a year later the Shogun Sport. That car sold until 2009 in the UK before being relaunched in a second generation PB series form that wasn't sold in our market which was because a decade ago Mitsubishi thought that tougher versions of its Mark III model Outlander and lower order long wheelbase versions of its largest Shogun SUV would adequately meet the needs of the market that earlier Shogun Sports had previously sold into. The company doesn't think that way now and in mid-2018, two years into the production life of the third generation QE series Shogun Sport design, decided to reintroduce this model for British buyers. Analyse the brand's product range at this time and the reasons for this change of heart become fairly clear, with Outlander sales focused almost completely around the road-orientated plug-in hybrid model and the fourth generation Shogun reaching the end of its sales life. Though at first glance, the company's UK product portfolio towards the end of the 21st century second decade seemed well stocked with capable four-wheel drive products, once you took a second look, it became abundantly clear just how much the British importers needed an up-to-date large SUV with proper off-road and towing ability, diesel power and space for seven. This car delivers that formula precisely. In an era where most SUVs are glorified Chelsea tractors, it's quite refreshing to hear Mitsubishi's perspective that around 35% of all Shogun Sport sales will go to buyers likely to use this car in a purely working environment. And virtually all will be sold fitted with a tow bar so that owners can exercise the prodigious 3.1 ton towing capacity of the single 2.4 litre diesel engine the brand is offering here. Despite that, there's no stripped out entry level model to target the farming and building markets. Sales instead concentrated around high spec trim levels that will relieve buyers of nearly £40,000. Can this model justify that kind of price positioning? Can it deliver the difficult balance of luxury and ultimate capability that potential buyers might be seeking? And would you want one if it did? Time to start answering those questions. When evaluating something that you've bought for a precise purpose, you usually take into account the need the product in question was designed to meet and adjust your expectations accordingly as to how it will perform in daily use. Here's another instance of how so often the motoring media doesn't seem to think that way. Most reports we've come across on this Shogun Sport have repeatedly reminded readers that in terms of ride and handling on tarmac, this Mitsubishi is some way off the standard set by the usual stylized contenders competing in its chosen SUV D segment. Well, of course it would be. 
This car is designed for the Serengeti as well as the school run, and that means the need for a weightier set of mechanicals, things like a more seriously engineered four-wheel drive system, a low-range gearbox, a rear differential lock, and tough suspension that's not going to continually crash the car onto its bump stops as you traverse deep ruts. None of this is going to deliver you any sort of Chelsea tractor, so if that's what you want, we'd point you instead to cars in this class like uh, Hyundai Santa Fe, Land Rover's Discovery Sport and Nissan's X-Trail. This Mitsubishi is aimed at a different breed of buyer, the kind of person wanting their SUV to really work for its living. The sort of customer who, in the class above this one, would probably be considering something like a Toyota Land Cruiser. That's a car the motoring press rarely disparages for not being car-like enough, recognising that Toyota as being a more serious SUV that requires a different standard of evaluation. It's the kind of thinking we believe should also apply to this Shogun Sport. You realise this car's more serious remit in the first few hundred yards of driving it. There's the kind of heft and weight to everything it does that might remind you of a solid, capable four-wheel drive pickup, which is hardly coincidental because that's exactly what this car is derived from. Its engine, platform and super select four-wheel drive system are all shared with the Mitsubishi L200 LCV. In fact, earlier generation Shogun Sport models weren't really much more than pickups with stylized SUV bodywork. The Japanese brand is keen to distance this Mark III model from that kind of analogy, pointing out that this QE series design features some fundamental engineering differences from its LCV pickup cousin. The most significant of these lies in the substitution of the L200's crude old leaf-sprung rear suspension for a much suppler multi-link rear arrangement with coil springs. Other differences over Mitsubishi's pickup model include the installation of a new 8-speed auto gearbox, a quicker steering rack, uh, bespoke body mounts, more car-like damping and additional cabin insulation. It's all enough, just about, to give this Shogun Sport at least a semblance of mass market SUV credibility. Providing potential buyers don't much care about the way this car lurches through corners taken at any kind of speed and rather crashes over poorer urban tarmac tears. The steering rack may be sharper but it still offers you little feedback as to what's going on as you turn into a bend. The single engine on offer, a gruff 2.4 litre diesel, has a whiff of LCV2, though the extra cabin insulation will be enough to soften its grumble if you can keep the revs down. Cruising in this car is actually surprisingly relaxed. Uh, the rise settles down at speed and you're actually more likely to hear tyre rumble and noise from the big mirrors than the engine on highway journeys. The slick shifting 8-speed auto gearbox you have to have on this model helps this Mitsubishi's cruising demeanour too. You'll rarely want to move into what the brand calls sport mode, which actually designates nothing more than a switch to manual gear shifting via the wheel-mounted paddles. Performance stats are pretty irrelevant on a car of this kind, but for the record, uh, 62 miles an hour from rest takes 11 seconds dead on the way to 112 miles an hour, which actually isn't bad for an SUV with such a hefty 2.1 ton curb weight. And more relevance is the torque figure, uh, 430 newton meters, enough to facilitate an impressive 3.1 ton braked towing capability that narrowly eclipses that on offer from a Toyota Land Cruiser. As you'd expect, there's a standard trailer stability system to negate trailer sway too. To give you some class perspective on that towing capacity stat, we'll tell you that most SUV D sector models can tug along no more than a couple of tons, so they'll really struggle, or perhaps be useless, if, for example, you've got a big boat or a really large caravan or horse box. The heavy-duty four-wheel drive setup obviously helps here too. Unlike those more car-like contenders in this segment that we've been mentioning, the Shogun Sport doesn't have a lightweight, on-demand style of all-wheel drive system that merely brings the back axle into play when a loss of traction demands it. Instead, there's Mitsubishi's well-proven Super Select 2 package, which has four driving settings. On dry tarmac, you'll nearly always leave the car in 2H, 
which directs all the power to the rear wheels. On wet or icy roads though, there's the option to use the circular super select controller just below the gear stick to shift into four wheel drive 4H at speeds of up to 62 miles an hour if you feel conditions are getting slippery. The final two settings are for off-road use. 4HLC locks the centre differential, thereby equally distributing power between front and rear axles, uh, improving traction on loose surfaces such as dirt, snow or sand. Finally, 4LLC brings the low-range gearbox into play, a feature that few other D-segment SUV models offer, but one that'll be essential for really extreme off-road conditions, such as climbing or descending steep inclines. If you really want to regularly maximise all that capability, you'd be best advised to get your dealer to swap the standard Bridgestone Jeweler tyres for grippier BF Goodrich all-terrain rubber. Should you still end up uh, with wheels spinning somewhere you really shouldn't have ventured into in the first place with this Mitsubishi, there's also the further possibility of locking the rear differential at the push of a button to help ease yourself out. At which point you'll appreciate this model's impressive set of mud plugging stats. An approach angle of 30 degrees, a departure angle of 24.2 degrees, and a ramp breakover angle of 23.1 degrees. For the Shogun Sport, the brand has embellished the Super Select 2 setup with a traction control system that has four specific off-road driving modes aimed at different kinds of surfaces. Choose between a gravel setting, one for mud and snow, one for sand, and one for traversing rock. Unfortunately though, there's no Land Rover style auto setting option to make all the decisions for you. As for wading, well, the lofty 218mm ground clearance figure makes it possible to deal with water up to 700mm deep and tackle deep fords and flooded country lanes that would see other SUVs turning back and joining queuing diverted traffic. If you're ever able to put all of this to the test, then make it back to tarmac safely, we think you'll be minded to be more forgiving of this SUV's bluff personality and slightly lumbering gait. After all, it's merely a question of adjusting your driving to suit this Mitsubishi's demeanour, with gentler inputs to steering and brakes, an emphasis on keeping up momentum, and a longer range journeying perspective that avoids sudden and needless control inputs. If you can be bothered with all of that, see no need to ever drive an SUV of this kind on its door handles and don't mind a higher than average set of running costs, then the payoff here is that you get the most capable rough road SUV in the segment. If that thought appeals, this Shogun Sport will too. Now we've seen pickup based large SUVs in our market before, turn of the century models like the Toyota 4Runner and the Nissan Pathfinder, but they've been very obviously utilitarian in style, as was the first generation Shogun Sport model that sold in our market between 1998 and 2009. Its third generation successor, this QE series design, is a little different. Now, no one is going to pigeonhole this as a rebodied Mitsubishi L200 pickup, which is perhaps appropriate. True, the two models share the same fundamentals, but the finished execution in engineering as well as in design is, as you see, very different. It's most striking at the front, where you get the latest interpretation of the brand's dynamic shield nose treatment, enhanced with chrome grille bars and striking full LED headlamps. Standard fog lamps sit either side of this lower skid plate, while neat touches include air dams positioned ahead of the front tyres to reduce air resistance and lift. And the way that these A-pillars are rounded and sit flush with the windscreen glass. Now, like all properly capable SUVs, the styling features on this one are claimed to be practically orientated too. This whole front section apparently angled so as to reduce the amount of splash over created when wading. From the side, the way that this chromed lower glasshouse line broadens and sweeps up at the rear is perhaps the most distinctive touch 
also have noticed this waistline crease that flows across the front wing from the headlamp cluster, then widens beyond the back door handle until it meets the rear light cluster as part of rear wings that taper inwards to smoothen airflow and lower drag. The generous clearance between the tyres and the wheel arches further emphasises this Shogun Sport's serious SUV priorities. Though these silvered side steps and the standard road orientated Bridgestone jeweler rubber specified with the large 18 inch diamond cut alloy rims won't help you in exercising them. Silver roof rails and rear privacy glass join these features on the standard spec sheet. The Rear styling is most notable for the distinctive vertical design of these LED tail lamps. They extend right down into a rear valance, uh, the lower part of which is embellished by this silver skid plate. Uh, that's been elevated to aid ground clearance. This wide chrome strip above the upper part of the number plate recess also adds a bit of crossover sheen. But of course, as usual, what's more important is the stuff you can't see. In this case, a heavy duty chassis borrowed from Mitsubishi's L200 pickup, but equipped with more car-like multi-link rear suspension rather than utilitarian leaf springs. Time to take a look inside. And it's here that Mitsubishi has tried to emphasize the sport element in this car's DNA. This raised silver trimmed console between the seats brings the leather wrapped auto gear stick, drive mode selector dial and off-road setting switches more easily to hand. And at the same time aims to create a more dynamic cockpit like feel that the designers have tried to complement with deeper sculpting for these smart black leather stitched chairs and a sportier steering wheel incorporating classy silver paddle shifters. There's a properly commanding driving position, not something you can take for granted in the SUV D segment these days. And though the materials that feature here are some way off the quality of those you'd find in a premium brand model, most of what's used to fashion the upper part of the dash seems to be reasonably smart. At first glance, that's a comment that seems also to apply to the brand's SDA smartphone link display audio system, a seven inch center dashboard color infotainment screen that sits above the climate control switch gear. Now from here, you access the usual DAB audio, media and Bluetooth phone features and access text messages too. This setup's monitor looks a little small by modern standards, nor are the graphics as crisp as other systems offered in this segment. Plus, well, rather unfortunately, the display lacks the physical volume and map scale knobs that it used to have when first we saw it on the brand's Outlander model. Mitsubishi also fits the same SDA package to its smaller Eclipse Cross SUV, but there mates it to a rather fiddly lower touchpad. Here, you're limited to voice activation or touchscreen functionality. A standard, this SDA setup includes Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring functionality. And that's something that you may find yourself using quite a lot because navigation isn't offered on any Shogun Sport variant. No, not even as an option. That approach won't play well with potential buyers who want to keep a cap on data usage or who habitually drive in areas with a poor network signal. As for other things you might wish Mitsubishi had devoted a bit more budget to, well, lower down the dash, there's plenty of the kind of plastic that would be better suited to this model's L200 pickup cousin, a comment equally applicable to the cheap feeling buttons scattered around less accessible parts of the fascia. Still, though all this might not look particularly pretty, it'll undoubtedly be fairly hard wearing. The column stalks come from an L200 II and because UK Shogun Sports are based on Australian models, they are a little annoyingly configured the wrong way round for a European market model. The result uh, is that the indicators are on the right and the wipers are on the left and that'll have you turning on the wipers at junctions and the indicators when showers start for the first few days that you drive this car. 
Uh, there's nothing wrong with the instrument binnacle layout, though, that uh, sees two clear dials separated by an information screen that gives you trip computer data, an eco driving meter, servicing info, and a display showing the level of four wheel drive activation. Getting comfortable is pretty easy, though the wheel could do with a bit more adjustment uh, for rake and reach. Electric seat adjustment is standard. Uh, you get these classy sunken stitching lines and the seat centres use multi-layered cushioning of varying density for better back support. Not so good though is their side support so you'll be sliding around a bit through faster corners. All round visibility is good thanks to that elevated driving position helped further by big door mirrors and the standardisation of rear parking sensors and a rear view camera. As for cabin storage space, well, that's probably aided by this car's pickup ancestry. True, the door bins aren't very big, but they get bottle holders with neatly angled bases, and there's a big, though rather cheap feeling, glove box, and an overhead compartment for your sunglasses. Twin cup holders sit behind the drive mode selector on a center console that has little storage channels on either side. Plus you get ticket clips on the sun visors and a decently sized lidded bin between the seats complete with 12 volt and HDMI sockets as well as a couple of USB ports. Time to take a seat in the second row and it's here that you'll notice the difference between this Shogun Sport and Mitsubishi's other SUV D-segment contender, the Outlander. This car is 90 millimetres longer, which ought to pay dividends for rear seat occupants. And once inside, well, to be honest, it's not especially spacious here for an SUV that's 4.78 metres in length, but there's reasonable room back here for two adults or three at a squash, with the third person's cause aided by the way that the central transmission tunnel has been kept reasonably low. Unfortunately, the seat base doesn't slide fore and aft in the way that you'd find with some rivals or in a conventional petrol-powered Outlander, but these rear seat backs do recline for greater comfort on longer journeys. What else? Well, there's a centre armrest with fold-out cup holders, uh, small but deep door pockets with bottle holders, uh, small cubbies in the door pulls and seat back pockets. But as you can see, the chance has been missed to put some useful media ports on the back of this centre storage box. Now, where that prodigious body length should pay off is enabling this Shogun Sport to provide third row seating that, in theory, ought to be more usable than it is on a conventional Outlander model. First of all, though, you have to get to it, which is an awkward task for older or portlier adults in most of this car's rivals for two reasons. First, because usually you can only access the third row from one side of the car, usually the offside. And second, because the middle row seat bases don't usually tumble out of the way. Normally in cars of this class, only the seat backs fold forward as the seat base slides towards the front, which isn't enough to give you very much of an aperture to get in and reach the very back. Now, with this Mitsubishi, it's different. You can reach the third row from either side of the car and the second row seat folding mechanism sees the seat base tumble forward as part of one folding motion that leaves you a wide aperture to gain entry. There's quite a step up to make though. And once you are in the third row, what's it like? Prior to taking a seat, we'd thought that the lack of a second row seat sliding function would rather compromise this Shogun Sport here with most drivers being able to slide the seat base ahead forward makes all the difference in alleviating what would otherwise be a rather claustrophobic feel back here. As it turns out though, this is less of a problem than we'd expected. Making use of that second row seat backrest rake adjustment that I mentioned earlier can make quite a lot of difference to the space that you get for your knees. Plus, it also helps that in legroom terms, there's actually a reasonable amount of room back here by SUV class standards anyway.
rather impressively, these third row seat backs recline as well. Now, obviously, a large MPV would offer far superior amounts of space to third row folk, mainly because a boxier people carrier can offer more roof height and doesn't have to accommodate chunky four wheel drive mechanicals, so can offer a much lower floor level. This Mitsubishi doesn't do badly in terms of roof height, but the floor level really is very high, which necessitates the kind of high floor that'll see adults sitting with their knees positioned up towards their chins. Far from ideal. For short to medium length journeys though, it'll probably be okay for uncomplaining folk, especially for the person on the right who's favored with twin cup holders and a 12 volt socket. Roof mounted grab handles and uh, vents are provided on both sides. Finally, let's take a look at the luggage space out back. Some buyers will, like us, be surprised to find a powered tailgate lacking on an SUV of this price. Once the hefty hatch is raised, you'll find revealed a luggage space that will inevitably be rather small if all three seating rows are in place. There's 131 litres in this configuration, only enough for a few shopping bags. A compartmentalised underfloor space tries to compensate and there are also a couple of tie down points, though no bag hooks. You've also got access to that 12 volt socket I just mentioned. And a proper spare wheel is fitted down here as standard. Of course, most of the time you'll be folding these rearmost pews into the floor. Doing that isn't the simple one pull process you might be used to from other large SUVs or MPVs. Instead, it's a two stage system that first requires you to pull on both of these middle mounted straps to uh, tumble forward the third row seat bases. Then you pull on the two outer straps to fold the third row chair backrest down. Now, if you think that's fiddly, then wait till the time comes to raise these third row chairs again. Because you pull up the backrests first, then you have to reach awkwardly over them to pull forward the seat bases, which won't be easy for shorter folk reaching into the, a car like this from the very back. It's really awkward. Um, and it's not possible to do this from the side of the car either. Once the third row chairs are folded, there is, as expected, a very decent amount of cargo room, 502 litres in total. If you need more space, then folding the second row backrest, unfortunately it divides 60-40 rather than in a more convenient 40-20-40 split, frees up 1,488 litres of space. Now because of that high floor, this figure is 120 litres down on what you get from a conventional petrol powered Outlander. Nor is there the option of a fold flat front passenger seat to extend the area for really long items. Still, what's provided will probably be sufficient for the needs of most owners. The Shogun Sport range is pretty straightforward, with a single 2.4 litre diesel four-wheel drive model on offer, featuring an eight-speed automatic gearbox and a seven-seat cabin configuration. Potential buyers are offered a choice of two trim levels, three spec, which costs around 38,000 pounds, and top four spec, for which you'll need to find around 40,000 pounds. For businesses, there's also a separate Shogun Sport commercial model, which features opaque rear side windows and replaces the rear seats with a 1500 litre load area, separated from the front of the cabin by a six inch bulkhead. Here though, our focus is on the passenger carrying version, which completes Mitsubishi's offering in what the industry calls the SUV D segment. In other words, the one that's a sector above the smaller Qashqai class crossovers that the Japanese brand targets with its mid-sized Eclipse Cross model. Mitsubishi's Outlander has long represented the company in that D segment and still does. That car though can no longer be had with the kind of torquey diesel power that buyers serious about off-roading tend to want. And you can't have it with seven seats unless you choose a conventional petrol derivative that very few buyers want. Hence the need for the Shogun Sport. 
read the motoring magazines and you'll tend to find this car compared, usually unfavourably, to the six seven-seat SUV models that sell most prolifically in the SUV D segment. Hyundai's Santa Fe, Nissan's X-Trail, Skoda's Kodiak, Land Rover's Discovery Sport, Kia's Sorento and Volkswagen's Tiguan Allspace. All of these can easily undercut the pricing of this Mitsubishi, but usually only with lower spec, more feebly powered diesel variants. Match, spec and power, and in most cases, you could easily find yourself in the same kind of pricing bracket that Mitsubishi is targeting here. And if you were to do that with any of the alternative models I've just mentioned, you'd be getting yourself an SUV that would be faster and handle better, but also one which would be much less capable off-road and which would have a significantly lower towing capacity. It all depends on what you want. Given the likely desire of potential Shogun Sport buyers to frequently tow and use this car for at least some of the time in a proper working environment, we think that magazine comparisons with the kind of lifestyle orientated D segment competitors just mentioned are frankly pretty irrelevant. A potential buyer of this Mitsubishi is someone much more likely to be putting down a deposit for the new generation version of Land Rover's Defender, or if not that, then Sanyong's Rexton, which in comparable form costs around two and a half thousand pounds less, but is uh, uglier and less sophisticated. Or Toyota's Land Cruiser, which in comparable form costs more than 10,000 pounds more. If, having considered all of that, you conclude, understandably, that there's actually nothing else on the market quite like a Shogun Sport, then you're going to want to know just how well equipped this SUV is or can be. Well, let's see. All versions of this car come with a complete kit of off-road engineering. Uh, the brand's Super Select 2 four-wheel drive system, an off-road terrain control system, a rear diff lock, hill descent control, hill start assist, and trailer stability assist. As for the luxury stuff, well, even the base three-spec model comes with plenty of it. At this level, you get 18-inch alloy wheels, full LED headlamps with auto leveling, roof rails, silver side steps, rear privacy glass, power folding mirrors, front fog lamps, auto headlamps and wipers, rear parking sensors, a full-size spare wheel, and a Thatcher and Category 1 alarm. Standard interior features across the range include leather upholstery, dual zone climate control with rear air conditioning, an auto dimming rear view mirror, uh, cruise control, power adjustable front seats, a reversing camera and leather for the steering wheel and gear stick. Infotainment is covered off by the brand's SDA smartphone link display audio system which gives you a 7 inch high definition centre dashboard colour infotainment screen with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring uh, as well as uh, Bluetooth phone connectivity and a 6 speaker DAB audio system. If you want more then the top 4 level spec that we're trying here delivers it you'd expect navigation and a powered tailgate to make the team sheet at this level on a £40,000 SUV of this kind, but both are still missing. What you do get though is an upgraded 8-speaker audio system with additional tweeters and a 510 watt amplifier. Plus there's a 360 degree surround view camera, uh, headlamp washers, front parking sensors, leather look door card trim, adaptive cruise control and various camera driven safety features that we'll cover off in a minute. On to extra cost accessories and options. I just mentioned that a striking omission on the plushest version of this car is the lack of satellite navigation. Now, it's all very well for Mitsubishi to point out that the Apple CarPlay Android Auto system means that owners can access navigation through their smartphones. Uh, but that won't help you if you need to find somewhere and you're in the country without much of a phone signal. It won't do anything for your phone carrier data charges either. As for other accessories, well, you're almost certainly going to be uh, paying your Mitsubishi dealer um, £650 more for metallic or pearlescent paint, because otherwise you're going to be stuck with the single solid colour that comes with the standard spec. That's polar white. We've got optional deep bronze metallic here. 
Now, Mitsubishi reckons that over 90% of Shogun Sport buyers will want a tow bar, so various different ones are offered. And if you're going to be regularly off-roading, you'll want to specify the underride protection too to guard against severe knocks and bumps to the underside mechanicals. And if that's the case, you'd also be well advised to get your dealer to swap the standard Bridgestone Jeweler tyres for grippier BF Goodrich all-terrain rubber. Talking of protection, an optional protection pack gives you textile floor mats, a boot tray, front and rear door sill protection, rear bumper protectors and a load area tonneau cover. A protection and spoiler pack includes a rear roof spoiler too, that item also offered separately. We mentioned the load area, uh, for that part of the car options include a bumper protector, a boot tray and a boot mat. There's also a dog pack that contains a dog guard and a boot tray. You might also want side window deflectors, a textile mat set or heated mirrors, and a bonnet guard can protect from stone chips. Entry guards can protect the door sills, these available in smart stainless steel, plus there are roof carriers for skis and snowboards. If you're interested in improving the aesthetics of your Shogun Sport, you could start with the alternative 18 inch alloy wheel design that the brand offers. There are also two styling packs. Styling pack one gives you black wheel arch mouldings, rear corner protectors, and a side door garnish in black. Styling pack two consists of a color-coded tailgate spoiler and rear styling element. There are various black finished optional elements you can add too. A side garnish for the lower door sills, wheel arch mouldings, rear corner extensions, and a black rear styling element. Enough with standard spec and options, let's move on to consider safety. Most of what you'd expect to find is included. Mitsubishi is especially proud of its RISE, R-A-S-E, or Reinforced Impact Safety Evolution System, which aims to disperse energy loads during side and rear crashes and controls distortion, enhances occupant protection, and also helps to protect the fuel system in the event of a rear impact. We also like the standard speed sensing automatic door locking that's fitted across the range. In addition, there's all the more conventional stuff too. So every variant gets twin front, side and curtain airbags plus a driver's knee bag. As you'd expect, there are the usual elements of electronic assistance too. Earlier, when discussing off-road features, we mentioned hill descent control and hill start assist, the latter feature also able to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions. In addition, there's a very effective MASTC setup, the Mitsubishi Active Stability and Traction Control System. Plus, if you stamp on the anti-lock brakes in an emergency, activating the standard brake assist system, the hazard warning lights are automatically activated to warn following motorists. But that's all fairly standard stuff by industry standards. In terms of going further, it's a bit disappointing given the price of this car that there's no kind of autonomous braking system supplied on the base 3 spec model. Mitsubishi does offer that kind of setup but you only get it with the TOPS 4 spec version. This flagship variant includes some of the choicest elements of Mitsubishi's latest camera and radar driven safety technology. We'll start with autonomous braking since we just mentioned it. The brand calls its setup FCM or Forward Collision Mitigation. As usual with these kinds of setups, this one uses a millimetre wave radar to scan the road ahead looking for potential accident hazards as you drive at urban speeds. If one is detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond or aren't able to, then braking will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. You can adjust the sensitivity of the FCM system via three settings, far, middle and near. This top four spec variant also includes two further safety features. One is pretty familiar on modern cars, a blind spot warning setup, which will alert you if you're about to pull out when there's another vehicle in your blind spot. The other though, you're less likely to have come across, Mitsubishi's ultrasonic misacceleration mitigation system. This detects cars parked to your front or rear when you're starting up 
and if necessary will actually automatically brake the car to prevent accidents that might otherwise be caused by unintended acceleration. So for example, if when you're stationary right next to a wall or another vehicle and you stamp on the throttle in drive when you thought you'd selected reverse, your Shogun Sport won't move, protecting you from a nasty and embarrassing prang. Neat. Given that supposed SUV D segment rivals to this 2.1 ton Mitsubishi can weigh as little as a ton and a half, it's not surprising that the Shogun Sport can't claim a very eye-catching set of efficiency stats. Sure enough, the official figures, 32.8 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 227 grams per kilometre of CO2, are pretty shocking if you're judging this car using standards set by more tarmac orientated models in this segment. But of course, that's an unrealistic comparison to make. If you pitch this Mitsubishi against the only other model in this sector equipped to match it off-road, Sanyong's Rexton, you'll find that its returns are closer to the mark, though they still can't match those of the Korean car. The age of this Shogun Sport's 2.4 litre diesel engine is though rather evidenced by the extent to which its figures are so far behind those of a comparable 2.8 litre Toyota Land Cruiser, which in long wheelbase auto form manages 39.2 miles to the gallon and 194 grams per kilometre. It doesn't help in this regard that Mitsubishi hasn't got around to adding an engine stop-start system to this car's 2.4 litre diesel power plant. However, this unit does get what the company calls idling neutral control that disengages the transmission torque converter when the engine's on at a standstill. This reduces the engine load at idle and therefore diesel usage from the decently large 68 litre fuel tank. To try and help owners maximise the efficiency figures that are possible, the Japanese brand provides an eco score system that's supposed to help you perfect an efficient driving technique, awarding you points based on your use of brake and throttle. You can keep a real time eye on your progress in this regard via an eco meter, which is one of the selectable options in the instrument binnacle trip computer screen. In the same place, you can also view a little leaf graphic, which quickly sheds its leaves if you're not driving in a particularly economic fashion. In running cost terms, one thing you might be encouraged by as a potential buyer is the decently long five-year warranty, though that's slightly spoiled by the brand's insistence on limiting it to 62,500 miles. As you'd expect in this day and age, there's a 12-year anti-perforation warranty and three years of pan-European roadside assistance and home start are included in the price. Servicing is required every year or 12,500 miles, whichever comes first, and you can keep maintenance costs down by purchasing a decent value prepaid servicing pack, which takes care of the cost of garage visits for three years or 36,000 miles. The pack costs £750 and Mitsubishi says that over 90% of its customers purchase it. Finally, we'll tell you that insurance is rated at 43D for both three and four spec variants and the predicted residual value is decently high at 40.1% after three years and 60,000 miles. The Shogun Sport is an interesting alternative to the volume maker seven seat contenders in the SUV D sector. Don't bother with it at all if all your driving will be done on tarmac, but if at least some of the time you'll need to tow heavy loads or venture from a paved surface, then this Japanese contender could appeal. It's well equipped, smart to look at, and has proven underpinnings that won't shake themselves loose the first time you power up an unmade track. To be frank, you'd hesitate to take more lifestyle orientated SUVs in this segment onto really gnarly terrain. This one is different and it comes with a 2.4 litre engine that won't feel strained even by really bulky trailers or larger caravans in the way that some competitor 2 litre diesel units sometimes are. 
As for issues, well, you can't expect a vehicle of this size with the weighty mechanicals needed for serious off-roading and towing to be especially clean and economical, or particularly rewarding to drive through twisty tarmac turns. And inevitably, this one isn't. Still, it's a good highway cruiser, and if you measure driving enjoyment in terms of off-piste capability, this Shogun Sport can serve up plenty of it. In summary, Mitsubishi has provided us with a spacious, well-equipped flagship 4x4 that delivers everything loyal brand buyers would expect a Shogun to be. In short, it's an SUV worthy of the name. And there aren't too many of those about these days.